Are you happy? <laughs> uh, auto members through the chair, and there is no muck up day. <laughs> I call the Premier. Thank you. Mr Speaker, in May this year, our government committed to introducing the most wide-ranging new laws to combat domestic and family violence, specifically targeting and making coercive control a criminal offence. Yeah. Today we take the first important and significant step towards achieving that. Today we will introduce into Parliament the first round of legislative reforms to strengthen Queensland's response to coercive control. The Women's Safety and Justice Task Force was very clear we must take the time to get it right. So this bill today lays the foundation for the passage of a standalone offence of coercive control next year. The Attorney General will, in a moment, outline the key elements of the legislation introduced today, but the intent is to ensure our laws keep pace with modern technology and the nature of stalking, focus on changing our approach to domestic violence, and foremost, strengthen our systems to ensure the protection of those people most at risk, while at the same time holding perpetrators to account. Yeah. Mr Speaker, today is a historic day in terms of how we address the insidious scourge of domestic violence and coercive control. My government has listened to the hundreds, if not thousands, of voices of people right throughout our state who want us to do more and act to address this abhorrent, dangerous behaviour. It's a sad fact that coercive control is real, and it's happening in our community. Tragically, frightening many women are subject to daily intimidation, control of their lives, control of their every move. They are often isolated from their families and their friends and subject to horrific psychological and emotional manipulation. Unfortunately, this behaviour is the most common factor leading to violence, often leading to homicide, and it has to end. My government's historic and wide-reaching reforms will protect victims. They will penalise offenders. Mr Speaker, the reforms we are introducing today will strengthen our state's response to coercive control before the introduction of a standalone offence by the end of next year. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, as soon as Professor Peter Coldrake handed down his public sector review, we went into action. I accepted his recommendations lock, stock and barrel. I set up a task force to implement the Coldrake recommendations. And today I will introduce the first tranche of integrity reform legislation. The Integrity and Other Legislation Amendment Bill 2022 and the Public Sector Bill 2022 to deliver on my commitment to implement the recommendations from the Coldrake Review of Culture and Accountability in the Queensland Public Sector and the Peter Bridgman Report, A Fair and Responsive Public Sector for All, yeah. as well as Kevin Ubrey's Strategic Review of the Integrity Commission's functions. Yeah. We commission them to enhance the best public sector in Australia. We're implementing them for the same reason. The Integrity and Other Legislation Amendment Bill is the first legislation in our reform path to further strengthen the independence of the authority of the Auditor-General and the Integrity Commissioner. Mr Speaker, Queensland's new Integrity Commissioner is Ms Linda Wall. Ms Wall is currently the Merit Protection Commissioner for the Australian Public Service. She has prior experience as a Victorian Assistant Ombudsman and the New South Wales Deputy Ombudsman. Mr Speaker, there will be more legislation as we go on, including the most revolutionary change in Australia to release Cabinet documents after 30 days, not 30 years. The Public Sector Bill supports a work face renewal which was envisaged by the Coldrake Report in terms of employment security, respect and inclusion. It implements the Bridgman recommendations for a new modern Public Sector Act so that Queensland has the most responsive, consistent and reliable public service possible, a public service that is fair, an employer of choice and a leader in public administration. These two bills, Mr Speaker, will help ensure we continue to have a great public service that gives fearless and frank advice. And as I said when Professor Coldrake handed down his report, we embrace it, we're going to implement it, and we've hit the ground running. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I always say you cannot be what you cannot see. As Premier of this state, I lead a government that is proud to support the achievements of women and girls and champion strong female leaders in an effort to achieve greater gender equality in the state. As I look around, I'm surrounded by strong women in this House, ministers, assistant ministers and members of parliament, all leaders of their communities, all inspiring the next generation of girls and women to have ambitions and to achieve their dreams. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Outside of this house, we also have some amazing female leaders. Dr Jeanette Young, the 27th Governor of Queensland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Chief Justice to the Queensland Supreme Court, the Honourable Justice yeah, yeah. Helen Boskell. Yeah, yeah. My Director General in the Department of the Premier and Cabinet, the Head of our Public Service, Rachel Hunter. Yeah, yeah. And Police Commissioner, Katarina Carroll. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To have so many women in so many key positions is a great achievement for our state. Yeah. And for it to be accepted as unremarkable today speaks volumes about how far we've come as a society. This is how it should be. We've also worked hard to get women on board, smashing our 50 per cent target of 2019, which has remained above that ever since. Yeah. 
Mr Speaker, I have some further great news on this front. Today I can announce three women into government leadership positions. A lot, of, a lot has been said in recent weeks about our landmark energy and jobs plan and how we are transforming our energy future to a clean, green, renewable one. Well, today I'm pleased to announce Sarah Zeljenko has been appointed as the new chair of Energy Queensland to help lead that transition. Yeah. Her experience across both private and public sectors, her roles in community groups make her an ideal person to lead Energy Queensland. She also previously held roles as General Counsel and Company Secretary for G8 Education and Wiggins Island Coal Export Terminal and Cement Australia. I thank outgoing inaugural chair Phil Garling, who has held the position since the merger of Energex and Ergon in 2016. Yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, I can also announce today that Patricia O'Callaghan is the new Chief Executive Officer of Tourism and Events Queensland. Yeah. Ms O'Callaghan is currently the CEO of Destination Gold Coast and before that was the CEO of Townsville Enterprise Limited and brings years of experience to the role. She will head our state's lead tourism marketing organisation and will lead it through the post-COVID-19 tourism landscape and we are well positioned to cement our reputation as Australia's best holiday destination. I also want to put on record and thank outgoing CEO Leanne Coddington, who will step down at the end of the year after nine years as CEO and more than 25 years with TEQ. Yeah. And the third appointment, Mr Speaker, is a new CEO for Screen Queensland, who will continue to lead our industry success. Courtney Gibson brings more than 30 years of industry experience and has worked with commercial and public broadcasters as well as the chief executive officer at two state screen agencies. Ms Gibson takes over from the outgoing Screen Queensland CEO Kylie Munich. I'd like to thank Ms Munich for her contribution to the Queensland screen industry over the past three years. Mr Speaker, I'd like to welcome all three esteemed and accomplished women to their roles and look forward to working with them to deliver for Queenslanders. <laughs> and finally, Mr Speaker, our veterans and their families have made an enormous contribution to Queensland over the decades. They dedicated their lives to keeping Queenslanders safe and secure. We have the largest population of veterans in the country, with 163,000 ex or current servicemen and women, and I'm proud that my government will continue to contribute to their own health and wellbeing. In March, we opened applications for two Anzac Day Trust grant programs, including for organisations impacted by the pandemic. Mr Speaker, I'm pleased to announce today the recipients of more than $1.6 million in grants from those two programs to support over 200 ex-service organisations, like $35,000 to the Australian War Widows Queensland. As they celebrate their 75th anniversary, we will honour those left behind on the inaugural War Widows Day next Wednesday at an event that I will host, yeah. host along with Assistant Minister yeah. Bart Mellish. Yeah. Others include $23,000 to Legacy Bunderberg. Yeah. Just checking them for Bunderberg's awake there. Yeah. <laughs> 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 $100,000. 100,000 to Legacy Club Brisbane, 40,000 to Legacy Club Gold Coast, 100,000 to Mates for Mates, 40,000 for the RSL in Gympie, 32,000 for the RSL in Harvey Bay, 40,000 for the RSL in Redcliffe, 27,000 for the RSL in Townsville and 40,000 for Young Veterans Australia. The funding will ensure ongoing help to those who served us so well. Many of the organisations operate on a voluntary basis and the grants will assist veterans and their families with household and medical expenses and welfare programs. Mr Speaker, Queenslanders are proud of their veterans and we must do what we can to ensure they are rewarded for their service. We will ensure their needs are met for them to look forward to a brighter future. I call the Deputy Premier. Uh, Mr Speaker, the Palaszczuk Government...